Hello everyone, and welcome to this, the second episode of Sodor Streets and Statues. I'm your host, Oliver Duck, call me Ted. Today, we'll be taking a look at the main line, the main standard gauge railways we love, their formation, and their last predecessor, sir. This Sodor and Mainland Railway, followed up by the formation of the Northwestern Railway, and all the way up to 1925 and the LMS Agreement. For those who do not know what the significance of some of those dates or names and things are, I would be very happy to hopefully share why they're so significant to me. When we last left off, we had just spent some time looking at the far west side of the island, particularly the Tidmouth Natford Nelsbridge Railway and the, the Wellsworth and Sudbury Railway. These railways that may have predated Northwestern were not the first railways on the island, and certainly not the first railway that made up a part of the Northwestern Railway. To find that, you have to go back much further. To days beyond even Scarlowe ran the rails of Sodor. The Sodor and Mainland Railway first had its start in 1850, when the company's original founders started promoting the line. They traveled the island, trying to gain support from local towns and communities, promising a broad connection to the mainland and fast travel and good service for all of the island. They traveled to Peel Godred and promised that town that there would be a branch line connecting them to the mainland in Croc. Their grand vision was that a line could connect the ancient capital of Sodor and Sudry to the mainland. However, what we got in reality was a bit different. Though the line was able to attract investment and open first operations in 1853, it wasn't really the grand sweeping and grand scale project that the promoters of it would have had the islanders to believe. The line ran from the harbour town of Kirk Ronan and the far south central area of the island up through the town of Rolf's Castle and towards Croven's Gate. Here, the land line ran to Balahu before trying to go into a tunnel under a hill to reach Vickerstown and hopefully thereafter the mainland. But there is two problems with this statement I have just said. Firstly, the Admiralty was not very happy that a very importantly strategic water path which was the span between Sodor and the mainland, would be blocked by this ambition. They demanded that no bridge would be able to be made that had any chance of obstructing any ocean-going vessel. Additionally, the tunnel I mentioned earlier, beyond Balahu before Vickerstown, didn't quite go to plan. During construction, a collapse rendered it useless and uneconomic. So trains only ever ran from Kirk Ronan on the harbour towards Croven's Gate and towards Balahu, which all these towns didn't have much significant industry or connecting traffic. Meanwhile, the railway was still planning for a much grander and broader scale. They had designs and parliamentary approval to continue their line all the way up through Kildane and towards Peel Godred. Additionally, their main line would have curved much lower elevations through Conk and towards Sudry. But none of these lines would ever be built. The latter was never designed. Because of the structure failures and ill-fated construction of the line, bad planning and insufficient funds, the line was doomed. It was helped, however, when the Scarloe Railway opened proper traffic on it and allowed its goods from its quarry to be interchanged at Croven's Gate, uh, so the slate could be shipped out to their harbour at Kirk Ronan. But the line never saw its full potential. They attempted to track uh, ships to Kirk Ronan, to travel to Ireland and other destinations that are able to be sought from this area of the United Kingdom. However, 
none came in this time period, and other local harbors on Sodor, such as Allsburg, as well as the mainland harbors, uh, had far greater success during this time. Inevitably, the line had to be closed. The line only ever had three engines. We know of one, however. His name was Neil. He was the engine who took Skarloey from his port at Kirk Ronan to Croven's Gate, where Skarloey has worked ever since. Neil had two brothers who worked with him on the line. Unfortunately, however, when the line was slated to close in 1901, Neil and his brothers were scrapped, and the full span of the railway, its assets, its track, its designs for track, was all put on the shelf, put on ice. What was easily to be sold was sold, but the rail line stayed in place, and the company and structure remained in some form. War! On July 28, 1914, war broke out in the European theater. After the assassination of Austria's leader by Serbian rebels, the powder keg of Europe exploded. With Germany put against France, allied to Russia against Austria, and other allies such as the United Kingdom and Turkey would soon call, be called into the fight along with the rest of the British Commonwealth, including Sodor. Defense analysis of the United Kingdom was undertaken, and since the German Navy, the high seas fleet looked formidable and a true challenge to the British Navy. Honest and possible considerations were taken into place of German invasions to the United Kingdom, and where were they likely to be? What parts of the island were left susceptible? Coastlines unprotected? Communities without ease of transport? And it was quickly discovered that one of the more susceptible parts of the United Kingdom within German range was the west and northern coastlines of the island of Sotor. To rectify this, an act of parliament was put into place that merged the three Sotor railways, two of which who had already been in the beginning of the merger, into one railway, the Sodor mainland, the Wellsworth and Sudry, as well as the Tidmouth, Natford and Ellsbridge Railway, together formed the North Western Railway. Plans were quickly made and executed to connect the far northern tip of the island Harwick to the mainland. The Admiralty eventually yielded and allowed a bridge to connect Sodor to the mainland. A new main line was made, double track, right from Barrow to Tidmouth, and plans had it to continue onwards. Construction at the beginning was fast and hard coming. Engines had to be borrowed. Some pulled out of the shops that were being built at the time and able to aid the construction of the line in the wartime. The old track of the Sodor mainland between Crovens Gate and Kelsthorpe Road was now fashioned as a new main line, as well as other of the plans were used and executed. Between Kelsthorpe Road and towards Kildane, their designs for a plan to connect to Peel Godred were hastily utilized to enable the main line engineering to be done up to Sir to Croc. However, these plans were not meant to connect to the low elevations of the west of the island. They were meant to connect to the high interior of the island. So by the time the line was in Kronk, it was far above the ocean. This required the viaduct passing through Marin and then Gordon's Hill to be constructed to bridge the designs of a high inland railway, the Sodor and mainland, the coastal lines of the west. The construction was hard going, but eventually the pace of construction slowed and eventually stopped. And then peace in our time. The war to end all wars had stopped. All of a sudden, no one really cared 
if Soder had a railway. The government support, borrowed engines, all left within the first four or five years of the railway existing. It was kind of a shamble. It was not designed to be economic. Of course, a railway built and connecting major cities was thought to be, you know, profitable and sustainable, especially in the heyday of railways and in the interwar periods, in the golden age of railways. However, this wasn't to be the case. The line faced major challenges. One of these is its relation to the LMS, which was by then the line that it was the interconnection in Barrow and Furness. The LMS saw the Northwestern as a competitor and saw it as a pot potential target for acquisition, so tried what they could to not be of any use. They discouraged any interconnections and disallowed the Northwestern's use of facilities in Barrow, basically making the dream of connecting to the main line not a reality. In the meantime, Mr. Hatt, who he last left off as being the chief engineer of the Tidmouth, Nafford, and Ellsbridge, rose to the same position in the Northwestern, constructing many of the grand structures along the line from tunnels and bridges to others. He set up the main facilities in Fickerstown, where the engines and primarily the trains were stationed out of, including a turntable and a roundhouse. So, if Mr. Hatt was the chief mechanical engineer in these critical years, one might ask, who was running the railway? Who was the senior person in charge at the time? There was a fellow named Albert Rigby, who was a baron, and lived at the Cronk Abbey estate. Albert was a great historian, spending 13 years to do a proper account of the island of Soto's history. And at the time of the recording, most of the information that we know about the early years of Soto, its heritage, its culture, its people, its geopolitics, came from his accounts and we'll be talking about this information in further episodes in the future. Albert himself claims that the Northwestern Railway only was able to exist in the first place because of his gift of a copy of Soder's history to the Chief of the Admiralty, the First Lord of the Admiralty, resulting in the Admiralty changing their mind on allowing the railway to build a bridge. From 1915, he was the chairman of the railway and was largely in control at the time. He believed in a proper future for the line. He didn't think it was some malcreation of the wartime effort. He truly thought that it had a chance of being a strong, profitable railway that served the people of the island well. It didn't have to be incorporated into one of the big four on its shores. In true tradition, in Sodor history and fashion, he was resilient against outsiders. He was resilient of people who come over and tell the Sodorians what to do. By 1923, Mr. Hatt had rose to the position of general manager, and together with Albert Rigby, they believed in a true future for their railway, and they fought for it. They were able to attract the ferry service from Dublin to the port of Kirk Ronan, and slowly by slowly they were able to increase the profitability of the line and solve the engine crisis. One hallmark of the success of the line was the successful acquisition of a contract from British Aluminium subsidiary in Peel Godred to connect the main line at Cronk through the interior of the island north to Peel Godred, in a manner that was reminiscent of the objectives of the Sodor and Mainland, who had once dreamed of this connection years before. They won this contract to build the new aluminium works and dam to facilitate the large loads of electricity required in aluminium winning from the mid Soto rail whose line was determined to be insufficient size, carrying capacity, and tunnel clearance to enable this development, and soon became a competitor of theirs 
for traffic inside and out of Peel Goddard. Due to the abundance of hydroelectricity, due to the hydro dam, the line was made electric, a new technology for the time. And so, even up to today, the Peel Goddard branch remains ran by electric engines. And a bit mysterious, as we've never seen it highlighted as a main feature in any books thus far. Before long, the LMS realized that they had real competition. And by 1925, they had been brought to terms. They recognized that the Northwestern Railway wasn't a part of the LMS and would allow a proper junction in Barrow and Furnace. However, this agreement wasn't a complete slam dunk for Mr. Hatt and Alfred Rigby. There were certain negatives for the Northwestern Railway. Some of the branch lines on the east end of the island, the Normby branch line and the Kirk Ronan, were to be run out of uh, Barrow and Furnace by the LMS. Additionally, Port services in Kirk Ronan were reduced for more of a interregional transport type service to a local transport type service, and shipping reduced for passenger ships to Ireland to two days a week, and viewed as more of a local service. From my humble position, this early fight of the railway by Mr. Hatt and Albert Grigby is the defining time of the line where it fought against odds outsiders naysayers and wa bad wishers against the threats of closure and lack of engines to create a profitable stable and successful railway one that would be able to go on to be the home of the stories the tales the engines and the people that we know and love so much and who built our childhood through this agreement, the new main station of the line was moved to Tidmouth, as that was the new terminal of the main line. Before this, the main line was only partially complete. As the construction was stopped before the line reached Harwick in the far north of the island, after Tidmouth, the line reached to the town of Allsburg, which was deemed insufficient to be the end of the main line, and the line between there and Tidmouth was converted into a branch line. Meanwhile, Vickerstown was severely reduced in size and stature and stripped of its large shed and turntable. A small one was erected to aid in the engines who used it to pull cars back and forth between Vickerstown and Barrow as a car ferry service. And the new turntable was erected in Barrow along with the new northwestern facility, including sheds. At this time, another event happened. New mines were sought out in the hills near Olstead, beyond the small village of Farquhar. And it was deemed that some more motive power was required to pull these trains. And the little blue engine was moved from the big station at Vickerstown, which was no longer going to be a big station to this line to pull quarried rocks to a harbor. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a tale for another day, and one that we might focus more on the engines, as well as the lines and the people and the history and the railways that enable their stories and their adventures to be so vivid for all of us. These early years of the island may not have many stories beyond the first few books, and even that, the events in the background are viewed from by many as just a way to retcon the early writing decisions. But if you look past the book, if you read between the lines, and you, you look and feel the emotions of the island around these engines, you, you understand the bitter stubbornness from the railway not be absorbed by the LMS, not be absorbed by the future British Railway in its entirety. It really is the defining time for the railway and enables everything. Mr. Hatt eventually rose to full position 
director before succeeding Albert Rigby as the chairman of the Northwestern Railway. And the hat regime, as it now became known, has run the railway since. However, the history, the railway, the people of those later years is a different story. And that's where we'll leave it to for today. Thank you everyone for watching. Please leave me a comment if you have any thoughts you want to share, any requests you want to have. And just remember everyone, history matters. See you next time.